And if there's anyone outside who can hear this who's interested in, a, in an interactive session, come on into Bartos Theater. Um, I'm proud to welcome Shiva Ayadurai, who's a lecturer in biological engineering, and Andrea Frank, who's a lecturer in the program in art, culture, and technology. Uh, they're going to do a workshop entitled this, Collaborative Cave Drawings of Social Interactions, Simple Visualizations of Complex Phenomena. So please join me in welcoming Shiva Ayadurai and Andrea Frank. So anyway, thank you. So uh, this is a, uh, actually a, a work in progress. So we want to... Um, Whoever's in here, we want you guys to have fun with this, and we're going to share with you uh, this work in progress where we are. But it's really a collaboration uh, between uh, Andrea's interest uh, that she's going to talk about in education and how uh, indoctrination takes place in my interest in systems and, and patterns. So without further ado, the uh, agenda is we're going to give a quick background how Andrea and I came together, because I'm obviously from the engineering and also visual arts, and Andrea's from uh, the art background in photography. And then we're going to go through and give you a simple example of what we call a cave drawing. And then we'd love people to actually participate. There's papers on the sides on a, a group interactive exercise. And we want you to have fun with this. And then we're going to have some discussion and we'll close. Okay? Andrew? Yeah. Thank you. All right. Good morning. Thanks for being here. Um, I'll, I'll start. Um, this might sound or look in this um, context of this conference a little funny right now. I'm going to show you some actually photographic works that I've been doing and um, I'm trying to frame them in a way that they start to make sense in what we're trying to do. I think it's somewhat relevant in order to understand what we're trying to do beyond regular system drawings of, of larger phenomena. Um, a first project that is relatively recent uh, looks really more at a larger context um, of global trade um, and shipping and looks at how through photographs that I'm juxtaposing from all over the world of ports and ships, cargo ships, how um, trade um, has created these invisible um, networks or lines crisscrossing the continents and the oceans and, and connecting a world that you know, has been earlier much more separated. Um, Another project um, that similarly tries to pull different pieces of information together is um, um, this project called Visions. It's a book on, it's an interview and portrait book that I created here at MIT, interviewing colleagues at MIT, basically, about their research, trying to understand how um, people working in, let's say, nanotechnology or um, energy or um, ecological issues, political issues in the arts, how, when we look at them next to each other, how all these um, parts of research might be able to, um, in our heads, come together to find ways of um, addressing and solving some of the major challenges that we are facing at the moment in, in the world, really. Um, another strand of work, my work seems to, in general, and these are it's a sele selection that I felt like related to what we're doing, um, kind of oscillates between looking at the larger picture to looking at things more inside and more uh, personal and um, psychological. So um, this project on mass experience came um, from looking at my um, German background and being here in the States I felt like, whoa, um, there's something about this that I need to investigate better, especially um, coming from a family where my grandfather died in the war as a soldier and you know there's this whole history there now I used the Hitler salute uh, which is this very iconic gesture as a um, metaphor or as an image to investigate this um, sense of mass um, experience what does it mean to be part of a group and kind of losing some of your own facilities and, and capa <laughs> mental capabilities almost um, when you're swept along in a certain energy so um, these are two identical images always that I um, painted on in one side. On the, left, on the right side here, I took out the, the faces and everything that was still visible except for the arms in order to show that energy. And in the other side, um, here on the right side, I kind of reinvented what was hidden by the raised arm and just you know, repainted those faces, trying to tear away that web and, and show the individual again. So looking at those kinds of relations of um, group indoctrination in a way. Case study is another series um, of photographs that looks um, at, um, at a building in um, Italy. Um, it's a former fascist youth, youth camp um, where children were um, going in the summer um, to be, you know, entertained. The, this building there was inaugurated by Mussolini, and clearly there was a very um, strong. Um, ideological framework around it. So to me that was interesting and it was very interesting to me to find this building um, totally, totally 
um, you know, closed and not touched and not torn down. So it became for me a metaphor for an inner um, landscape of a generation that has this past that is quite heavy and and hard to grapple with in, in the present moment. So it's, it's there, but it isn't touched, and, and the dust clearly is accumulating. Um, beloved Child, the last series I just want to touch on here um, quickly um, deals with the children. It actually grew out of this last, um, the, the previous project where I was literally looking for the kids, but children from all over the world, and how children are um, maybe educated in when they enter from, you know, like a more sheltered family into um, group situations. And um, the images kind of look at how um, society as a shaping and forming force might be visible more or palpable more or less in, in the different contexts. And, and it kind of, you know, wants to pull awareness to, to this very fragile place like childhood and how important it is, what, what children are exposed to, what we expose our children to, um, in, in, in this time of um, big, big learning. That's really my side, and now Shiva will bring in something that probably takes us much closer to our drawing. Yeah. So anyway, when... Uh, is this back on? John? So, uh, so, so my area of research you know, has been in um, patterns and systems across a variety of fields. I've been in and out of MIT for probably about 20 years in about four different departments. But one of the core things is... Um, you know, as humans, we typically try to, the, the common exercise we try to do is we try to understand nature, we try to look at patterns of connection, and we try to put together systems to make sense of that. So for, in the Eastern systems, right, one of the things people used to do is they used to look at the world, and this is a simple drawing, it's a system drawing, right? They used to look at the world and try to put the phenomenon of existence and how we interrelate to the world. So this is actually a drawing from traditional Chinese medicine, but you can see there are various components in this system, and uh, in, in this case we're using words, fire, earth, metal, water, and wood, and then the arrows represent how those uh, elements move among each other. So fire creates earth, earth, uh, fire burns to create earth, it, within the earth we find metal, and with, uh, metal condenses on, uh, water condenses on metal, right, and water gives support for wood, and wood gives support for uh, fire. In systems theory you call that a positive feedback cycle. But you also have what's called a negative feedback cycle, where things control each other. So, for example, water extinguishes fire. And uh, fire melts metal. You know, metal cuts wood. Uh, wood essentially holds earth down, and earth uh, dams water. And, and though each of those uh, components can represent different organs in your body. So it's a very simple diagram, but it re represents tremendous complexity, probably of 2,000 years' worth of knowledge. So... Andrew and I were very interested, could we take these kinds of drawings and start looking at complex systems? Just to give you some other examples, in the Indian system, they represent the entire universe using this simple drawing. You have uh, the concept of existence and non-existence, purusha and prakriti, and then they give rise to what are called different types of uh, phenomenon, and those phenomenon give rise to the body and what they call panchabhutas, which are these five other elements which give rise to these body types, and that's what makes a physical body. Okay, so it's a different type of drawing, but you can see just in a simple drawing, we're capturing a tremendous complexity. And um, if you can see this in the, uh, this is another example of representing it. Unfortunately, the diagram doesn't come well, but so that's in the ancient world. In the modern world, in systems biology over in the engineering group, people are trying to use drawings to capture, let's say, how, you, how do you model the entire body. So today, in systems biology, if you can see in the diagram on the bottom, on the outside, you see molecules which give rise to interactions of molecules, which give rise to cells, which gives rise to tissues, which give rise to the whole organ. Okay, so we're representing um, other types of phenomena. You could represent it as a pyramid, where on the bottom you have scales, uh, spatial scales. So on the bottom you have genes and proteins, and the next level you have interactions of those. Then you have functional modules, and you have whole organs. This is actually a drawing from Peter Hunter's work out in Auckland, but one of the things in systems is you also have spatial and temporal scales. So along one axis, you have things going in time. So here, someone's trying to model the whole body, but they're looking at one organ system. Let's say the heart, which is made up of various types of tissues, which is made up of various types of proteins, which is made up of various types of molecules. Okay, so you have the spatial component. And... Uh, Here's another example from systems biology also, where you're looking at the interactions of different kinds of proteins. 
And so I got involved in this many, many years ago. I, I created one of the first email systems, and this is a drawing of how email works, right? So you see computers talking to modems, which are transmitting emails. And um, this was back in, back in 1977. And, and uh, that led me to start taking that to do larger scale systems. Um, I left MIT in 93, and we built the large scale system for um, analyzing email that came out of the White House, where you have email coming in, that's the input there, and then it gets uh, uh, filtered in some way, stored, and then up on the up, upper right, you see the analysis take place, and you have outbound going out. So you typically in these systems have input and output. So to make it a little bit simpler, if you, if I, I can show you different systems, but to um, let me bring it down to, so sort of, I hope you can see this. So these are, this is sort of getting very simple. So if you look at, any system has typically some type of input, it has some type of processing, okay, which is the middle, and you have some type of output. And there's typically some type of storage. So this is a very, very simple drawing. And um, if you can see this, this is a, if you can see back, this is a cow, right? He takes in some food, and he processes it. Digestion is a process. You get some type of output milk, and you get some, obviously, manure also. And you can get a little more complicated. Here's a factory system. You have raw material coming in in red. There's a, a process that takes place, conversion of that. There's a warehouse that stores it. And then you have temp, some type of finished goods. You can have multiple systems where you have one system communicating to another, right? The input of one flows to the output of the other. The input of one flows to the output of the other. So what Andre and I wanted to explore was, could we take these very simple drawings and start looking at very complex social interactions? Because typically, for an ordinary person, let's say, to understand how we exist in this world, how we interact with capital flow, money flow, you know, indoctrination, can we represent very simply versus someone having to go read a, a book by you know, Howard Zinn or Chomsky or have to, have to go read the New York Times? Can we do it in very, very simple drawings that are still as compelling but can reach more people? So, uh, so that led to us. Uh, so now we're going to move to the part where we're going to actually do this work in progress we're doing. How do you take very complex phenomenon and convert it to something that's simple. And then after that, we want, we're going to give you guys some examples where you, we want you to experiment on the sides. So I'm going to switch over to this overhead now. I think that should come up. So, so I'm going to, uh, so Andrea and I are going to do sort of a, because um, when we were doing this, the idea, it's some very interesting problems from a visualization. How do you draw things really simple? But uh, make it. You're doing just move a little bit to the left and right and keep yeah. moving, <laughs> keep drawing. We, you we, know, it doesn't have to be perfect. We. <laughs> yes. We will take pictures and then we're going to put them up on the web Super. later on also. So.